We still got plenty of food, right? We didn't run out yet. I just want to make sure everyone gets enough food to eat. Because Google paid for my lunch today. I'm like stuck. I ate way too much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll stall until you're ready. I'm really good. Since about 2014. So, um, welcome, guys, to the uh, machine learning meetup. I've got some familiar faces who like to come back because apparently we provide decent enough content for you to want to come back, uh, which I think is awesome. I'm glad I can provide that content. Um, and there's plenty of new faces, which also makes me excited because then hopefully I'll convince you to come back because I provide awesome <laughs> content. Um, my name is Mariah. I work here at Weave. Uh, my title is yet to be determined, but I call myself a data engineer because I build the data pipeline. Uh, but I also run the ML Guild here, so I'm teaching a whole bunch of people how to do machine learning. Uh, if you ever want to do machine learning in Go, I can tell you a whole ton of crap about that. That is my pretend uh, expertise, is machine learning in Go. Um, and yeah, uh, other things, uh, this meetup is sponsored by Ford Utah. Ford Utah sponsors a whole bunch of meetups and we have a nice little Slack community uh, that we want everybody to join so that you can get all your information, share your tips and tricks. Uh, when I post funny cares memes, you get those pictures too about, uh, about stuff like that. So um, that's at, uh, so it's uh, bit.ly slash forge slack that's a, how you join the forge thing you can also follow us on twitter at forge utah um or you can find all of our videos on youtube you can find last time danny spoke on youtube if you really want that's also forge utah um we've got stickers up at the front feel free to rate them i just got back from a conference where they gave me way too many stickers so i have a lot to get rid of um other than that, do we have any announcements from you guys? Any jobs, any fun community activities, conferences, other things, whatever? So the first and second of November, they're having the Big Mountain Data Conference, and they're looking for speakers for it right now. First and, where is that? Stanley Solway. Why have I never heard of that? It's a Big Mountain Data. I'm Googling that right now. And, and Saturday, I think that is uh, this Saturday is SQL, Ser SQL Server. SQL Saturday. SQL Saturday. This Saturday? Mm -hmm. Are you guys on my Slack? Because oh, I want. On it. You oh, should join. On the, on the Geek Big Data Geeks. Uh, uh, what's it? I'm saying if you, I just like, if you join the Ford yeah. Utah Slack, I'd love, yeah, I'll, 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 I would I'll, love to have those links posted there mm -hmm. so that we could all know. People that aren't here could know as well. And then I could. Uh, yeah, Pat Wright, I don't know if you know Pat Wright, he, he, he runs that group, so okay. him and Nick. But they're looking for a lot of speakers. For sure. And the more machine yeah. learning. The better? Well, I would like to machine learning. There we go. So the better. <laughs> the more machine learning we can talk about, the better. Yeah, but they do all kinds of. Yeah. So if you want to, uh, join that Forge, the Forge, Utah. Forge Utah Slack, so it's bit.ly forward slack no it's this way but everyone's this way forward slack i like always have a whiteboard here and they stole it from me um and it is free by the way the conference awesome okay uh other than that looks like mr danny is ready i'll let him introduce himself a little bit more um if you want to plug in it's right here i threw it on the ground that's a great video, by the way. Good on ground. Yes. Oh, I love the other. Uh, yes. Uh, I just do yeah, the you HDMI can just do the HDMI. I hope. Is that one attached to the thing? It was previously, <laughs> previously attached to the thing. I think we're going to go through AirPlay right now. I have another cable, but man. Yeah, go ahead. So if you just go up to AirPlay's training room. Sorry. 
to resolve technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Danny, or Mr. Danny, I guess, as Mariah is going to be calling me. Oh, I call everybody Mr. <laughs> uh, so I'm a solutions architect at Cubal. I'm going to try to minimize the amount that I talk about Cubal, but they did pay for me to fly here, so it is my responsibility to talk about them at least a little bit. Um, so at Cubal, I work as a solutions architect, which means that I enable companies all throughout the Rockies, be it uh, Salt Lake City or really anywhere in Utah, throughout Colorado, and also throughout the Pacific Northwest to use Cubal as a product and enable them to perform data science and machine learning at scale using Spark ML and other products that we offer as part of our platform. Um, we have customers that range in size all the way from the lifts of the world down to a couple of local startups in Salt Lake City. So if you are exploring your options with big data solutions, Cubal is definitely a great one, and I highly recommend that you come talk to me after the talk. And I promise that's as much as I'm going to be talking about Cubal. Um, additionally, I want to give a quick shout out to Matt Housley, who disappeared to take a phone call, I guess. Um, he, uh, okay. His business partner? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, Matt and Joe run Ternary Data, which is a local SI partner that we have here. They're really, really great consultants. Matt has a PhD in pure mathematics, so he's a hell of a lot smarter than I am, uh, and he can help you get set up with whatever kind of big data solution. He's also uh, a great chauffeur, so highly recommend befriending Matt. So uh, in today's presentation, we're going to be talking a lot about automated machine learning. Right. Specifically, I'm going to be focusing on automated machine learning in Spark because that's part of the Cubal platform and that's the distributed framework for performing machine learning that I'm most familiar with. But I'm going to be talking from mostly um, a high level, a somewhat academic perspective on different aspects of automating the machine learning pipeline. And that means that whatever I say can be applied to whatever type of methodology or models you're trying to use. So whether you're working in R, in Python, using a distributed environment like Spark, whatever it is that you're doing, all of these concepts are fundamental enough that you should be able to apply them to whatever it is that you're doing in your job. Before we go on, I forgot an announcement. I'm going to have a raffle for a data grip, one year, not data grip, a year long JetBrains license at the end. And it goes based off of the RSVPs for this, this uh, event on meetup.com. So if you're not already RSVP'd to that event, if you could do that during this talk, that way at the end, we can just run off of that. Okay? You're all good. Sorry. Yeah. I forget that every time. Um, and if, if you're going to do that, I'd recommend doing it like right now because at some point the conversation is going to start building on top of itself. So later on, if you miss a second, you might get well, you might fall through. So let's start off by talking about in general, like what what is AutoML? So you guys might have heard of AutoML in the context of particular products, right? Like H2O has something that they call AutoML. H2O is a, a great platform. Um, GCP has cloud auto ML where you just plug in some data and then uh, it automatically trains a machine learning model for, from you and you're before you and you're totally uh, obfuscated. The model is totally obfuscated and you don't know what's going on under the hood. Auto ML is a term that's thrown around a whole lot, but fundamentally automated machine learning is what it sounds like, right? It's the process of automated <coughs> machine learning workflow, which I define as having three particular parts. Primarily, it focuses on automating the building and validation part of the machine learning workflow. But as I'm going to talk about at the very end, there's some really cool and exciting development being done in terms of automating even the exploration and the preparation of data, which is usually seen as being something that's human knowledge needed. So for, uh, for Cubal and for myself, the way that we divide up the machine learning workflow is into three segments. So you start off by exploring your data. You perform EDA, create visualizations, compare different uh, variables against each other, look for 
correlations in the data, basically get an intuitive understanding as a human being for what it is that your data is talking about and what the relationships are within your data. And then you're gonna start preparing your data, right? So you're gonna clean it and you're gonna be performing feature engineering in order to extract useful data points that you're gonna then train, that you're gonna then feed into training your machine learning model. So once you've done your data preparation and exploration, you're gonna start off on the building and the validation phase. And that's really where I'm gonna be talking the most about automated machine learning because that's where we see the majority of progress being made. So services like H2O's AutoML or Google's Cloud AutoML, both of those require clean, already prepared data going into it. They're not gonna do very much feature engineering or any kind of data cleaning at all. So they're only automating the second step and the reason that they're doing that is because across academia, we found a lot of good ways to automate a lot of steps in this process. So this step fundamentally is about selecting a machine learning model, building models, comparing them against each other, and then selecting the best model. So there's an objective metric that we're going to be evaluating against. Now, this is really important because it allows us to simplify what it is that a data scientist does into a non-convex optimization process. Right? We're simply saying that we're going to be optimizing for some kind of accuracy metric, be it you know, R squared, mean squared error, um, uh, predictive accuracy, uh, the area under the ROC curve, whatever it is, we have a single number that we're trying to optimize for, and we're going to be selecting our model, and as I'll talk about later on, selecting our hyperparameters based around optimizing for that particular score. Um, now, the last phase of the machine learning workflow is deployment and monitoring. That's not something that I'm going to be talking about today. As Mariah pointed out, if that's something that you're interested in hearing more about, I gave a presentation about that at the Utah ML meetup uh, a couple of months ago. So if that's a topic that interests you, definitely check out the video on YouTube. Shameless plug for myself. So the very first step of the, the building and validation phase is model selection. And this is really the easiest thing to automate because it has the fewest number of variables but it's still kind of a lot of variables, right? So when we're trying to select our model, we are faced with a lot of choices. I've pulled out a few of the most common, and you'll notice if you're familiar with machine learning that these model types that I've selected are actually categories of models. So for instance, neural networks refers to a whole bunch of different types of neural network architecture, everything ranging from a fully connected artificial neural network to a convolutional neural network or a recurrent neural network. Uh, something like support vector machines can have any number of different kernels which render them to be functionally different types of models. But even looking at these broad categories of models, we can see that there is a lot of decisions that need to be made. So let's think about how we would automate the process of selecting a model between these different types of models. Well, if we have a fundamental objective metric that we want to evaluate against, it should be pretty simple, right? We can just train like one random forest, one support vector machine, one K nearest neighbors. We can see how they all perform and then we can select the best one. So let's automate this process by having our computer train all of these and then automatically select the best one of them. Now we haven't really saved ourselves much time because we could have manually looked at all of these different types of models and seen which one performed the best. But model selection is just the first step in the process of automating the model of automating the model building phase of the, of the process. And the next one is hyperparameter optimization. So all of these different types of models have hyperparameters that make them up. In the case of let's say gradient boosted trees, we have the depths of the trees that are being built. In the case of neural networks, there's a whole bunch of different hyperparameters that need to be selected, right? The number of layers in the neural network, the number of neurons in each layer, the activation function, all of these different components make up hyperparameters. And the, the process of trying to select hyperparameters can be one of the most time intensive things that a data scientist does. Hopefully not, because realistically, a data scientist isn't uh, a monkey, right? A data scientist should spend their time finding interesting problems and finding answers to them. But theoretically, if you're just trying to cut down on your accuracy score, if you're just trying to make your model as efficient as possible, you can see great leaps and bounds and improvements in your accuracy by spending a lot of time on hyperparameter optimization. So the majority of different types of models have hyperparameters that you can tune which will then result in some kind of model improvement or you know, if you go the wrong direction, model worsening. And this is where we can really think about this in terms of an optimization problem, where we have a surface, right, where each one of our x-axes can be defined as different hyperparameters 
And then our response variable, in this case, accuracy, is the thing that we're trying to optimize for. If this seems a little bit abstract, we're going to dive into a notebook that I've created where we can take a look at hyperparameter optimization in the real world. Um, is this screen super small for you guys as well? Yeah, you need to zoom like four or five times. How's this? More, four more, times. More times? I can yeah, see it's... that. Right. Is it good? Everybody good? Um, so this is the notebook that we're going to be running through concurrently to the PowerPoint presentation that I'll be running through. Um, I promised that I wouldn't talk more about Qbol. Uh, I'm sneaking in a view of our interface just so that you guys know that we have a notebook product. Um, so the very first thing that we need to do, right, when we're going to be performing this type of hyperparameter optimization is we're going to read in our data. Um, I've selected an open source data set that's already pretty clean, so I'm not going to have to do too much data cleaning, data cleansing for it. Um, I'm just going to read in the CSV that I have being stored in S3. Um, I need to do a little bit of uh, data preparation in order to feed it into Spark ML. Um, don't worry too much about this step. This is really just a quirk of Spark ML that we have to assemble all of these different uh, feature columns into uh, vectors. And then once we've done that, we have our final design matrix, which we're going to split into a training, a validation, and a testing set. And this is a really important step of the process, right? Cross-validation is something that a lot of data scientists take for granted, but it's really, really important both in the model selection as well as in the hyperparameter optimization phase. So in the process of selecting our model, what we want to do is pick the best performing model. Right? We want to pick the model that's going to perform the best on incoming production data. Right? We don't care how well our model performs on the training data that we trained it with. Really, what we should be caring about is how well is this going to perform against a randomized data set that hopefully is going to be representative of what's actually coming into it from the real world. So in order to make sure that we can objectively evaluate our model and compare different types of models against each other, we're going to split our data into the validation, into the training and the validation set. And then at the very end of this exercise, we're also going to use a test set, which we're going to be pretending is real production data. So we're going to be training our models with this data frame called train, and then we're going to see how those models perform using the validation data frame. And then at the very end, we'll look at the test. So uh, the very first thing that we're going to do is train a single model. So for the sake of the entirety of this presentation, I'm going to be using random forests. Uh, random forests are incredibly powerful models. It's not really within the scope of this presentation to explain exactly what it is that they do, but basically understand that they have two primary and very fundamental hyperparameters. They have the depths of trees in the forest and the number of trees in the forest. And we can optimize these two hyperparameters in order to make our model perform more accurately. In order to make it more efficient. So the very first thing that we're going to do is use this set of defaults uh, for the hyperparameters that we've chosen. So I'm going to select, um, select a max depth of 13, meaning that each tree will have 13, uh, 13 splits. We're going to select five trees to be trained within our random forest. And you don't have to worry about the seed. That's just a random seed to make sure that this notebook runs consistently in the same way every time I run. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to fit our model, meaning we're going to train it against our training data. Um, as you can see, the process for training something like this in Spark is super easy. It's really similar to what you would see in something like Scikit-Learn. Uh, once we've trained our models, we can transform, which is to say we can perform the inferencing that the model has actually been trained for against our validation data. And that allows us to generate our set of predictions. Uh, and then we can evaluate the performance of our model using an accuracy metric in order to decide how good was our model. So uh, in this situation, higher is better. Just keep that in mind. Um, we've, received, we've received an accuracy score of 0.81. Thank you. This is, um, this is a pretty good score, but I'm going to tell you that we can definitely improve it by doing a little bit of hyperparameter tuning. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at the depth of the model. Uh, we, or the, yeah, the, the depths of the trees in the model. And we're going to select a whole bunch of different depths. Because remember, it actually becomes really, really easy to start training a bunch of models side by side. right? With the ability of, comp of computation, we can really take the human out of a lot of components. Rather than having to train each one of these models one by one, I can just, as I did here, write a single for loop. It took me you know, 30 seconds, and I had to look up how to write a for loop in Python because it's been so long. And at the end, it's going to be training uh, 13 different models. right? 
So once we've trained these 13 different models, we can evaluate them again, taking a look at their accuracy metrics. And you can see that they range all the way from 0 0.800 to, well, it looks like our best performing one was 0.824. Uh, so you know, this is a lot of numbers to look at all at once. So maybe this would be a little bit easier to look at in terms of the visualization. So we can use a visualization library such as Plotly to see the relationship between our accuracy and uh, the, this one particular hyperparameter that we selected, right, the depth of the tree. And we see this really simple curve being created here, where if the depth of our tree is too small, it doesn't perform super well. If the depth of our tree is too big, it doesn't perform super well. So we need to select something in the middle. In this case, the thing that's in the middle that works the best has uh, is the, the depth of seven, so seven splits in the tree, and the accuracy score that comes as a result is 0.825. So we can see that you know, optimization, in this case, we can treat this as a, a, as a simple convex optimization problem, right? In that there is an absolute minima and that there aren't any local minima that we have to worry about getting stuck in. Uh, or in this case, we're optimizing for a maximum. So we've looked at one of the hyperparameters that we're going to be exploring. Now let's look at the other one, right? So random forest, uh, again, has two primary hyperparameters that we're interested in, the depth of the tree and the number of trees. So let's just repeat this process all over again for the number of trees, right? So in this case, we're going to select anywhere from 1 to 14 trees. We're going to train, again, 13 models on this, uh, this series of hyperparameters. And when we plot our data, we see a little bit more complex of a relationship between the number of trees and the, the accuracy of the model. Now, keep in what mind... What are you using for this second one? Or Sorry? <clears throat> well, for example, the first one, you just said, hey, I'm changing depth in the next one you're changing trees, but what assumption did you make for? That's a really, really good question. And that plays really nicely into what I'm gonna talk about okay. in like a minute. Um, basically, I kept it with the, with the default, um, which in this situation, uh, I don't remember what the default was. Okay. But, but basically I kept it with the default, but that's a really, really good point. And thank you for thinking ahead about this because this matters a lot, that we are making an assumption about in this situation, we're keeping the depth the same, regardless of the number of trees that are being trained. Um, by the way, uh, thank you for interrupting me. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. This is a topic that I'm super excited about, and when I get excited about things, I tend to word vomit a little bit. So feel free, if something isn't making sense, you're probably not the only one that it isn't making sense to. Yeah. You have a visual that shows like, kind of like a sensitivity analysis, like, you know, one thing, two dimensions, and then what's a combination that brings like the highest. Man, you guys are so smart. <laughs> like basically building this presentation for me. Yeah, that's coming in like three minutes. <laughs> that's a really good predictive model you've got in your head. <laughs> um, so backtracking, right? Um, I, I've selected bounded ranges, right, where I'm only looking between one and fourteen for the uh, the depths of the tree. I'm sorry for the number of trees, and only looking for a limited number of possibilities for the uh, the depths of the trees. So, you know, in, in the real world, we don't really know which general part of the hyperparameter space the best accuracy score will come from. So it's possible, you know, it doesn't really look like it because it looks like it starts going down around 13, but it's possible that if I had extended this and if I trained this on like 100 trees, maybe that would have performed even better. And that's a really important thing to understand about the process of hyperparameter optimization is that even though it allows us to explore a larger space, a larger, uh, a larger surface area than if we had merely been looking at one particular pair of hyperparameters. In this situation, we're not capable of exploring the entire space. And realistically, because the set of real numbers goes on to infinity, it's impossible for us to explore the entire hyperparameter space. So the only, uh, the only thing that we can say is that this is the best solution out of what we've explored so far. So backtracking. Uh, it looks like there's a few that perform a, a few different options for the number of trees that perform all reasonably similarly and reasonably well, right? So like seven, nine, and 11 perform really well. As soon as you start getting below seven or above 11, it looks like you're not performing quite as well. Um, so that's hyperparameter optimization in a nutshell, right? We're trying to select the best values for these different hyperparameters that go into our model. And what I've shown you so far is one dimensional, right? We're only exploring a single dimension, only a single hyperparameter at a time. And you know, we could say the best model is the one where we pick the best hyperparameter from our one dimensional search in the depth and one hyperparameter in the, uh, in the search for our number of trees. But 
uh, as those of you who are familiar with statistics know, there's often correlations between variables, and it's possible that the best of one mixed with the best of the other isn't necessarily the best of both, right? Which is why we need to start looking at the interactions between our variables in the situation, right? Which means that instead of looking at a one-dimensional space, we're gonna start looking at a two-dimensional space. But if you think about it, that makes this problem a hell of a lot harder, right? We had 13 to start with, and then another 13, so 13 squared makes 149, <coughs> And that's still only looking at two <laughs> hyperparameters, right? So two hyperparameters with a pretty limited search base is already generating for us 169 different combinations that we need to explore. And that's one of the things that we're gonna be talking about is trying to optimize this problem of how do I do this without having to train every single model? Because in this situation, I'm training this on a pretty small data <laughs> set. I'm using Spark, which is a very efficient way of doing distributed computing at scale. But even with Spark, even with distributed computing, Google still takes days or even weeks to train a single neural network. So think about what that means if you have to train multiple neural networks and compare their performance against each other, right? You wanna start coming up with heuristics or other ways of doing hyperparameter optimization or model selection that allow you to get around the possibility of, well, I don't wanna explore the entirety of the space. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's start with the most trivial thing, which is called grid search, which we've already basically explained um, what that refers to. Basically, it's where we treat our hyperparameter space as a grid and we look at every single point on that grid. So to repeat the, you know, the in-depth experience or the hands-on experience that we had before, we can just train these nested for loops. And as you can see, one of the issues with grid search is that it takes a really, really long time to run because we have to explore the entirety of this hyperparameter space, right? I launched this, uh, this notebook to run before I started this presentation, and it's still running on this paragraph because it needs to go through 169 different combinations. So um, as you can see, we can compare a lot of different depths and a lot of different trees. We get resulting accuracy metrics. And thankfully, because this is, um, because this is oh shoot, unfortunately it hasn't cached my old run of this. So we are gonna need to wait for this to finish before we get a chance to look at the two dimensional uh, surface, which really is gonna be plotted in three dimensions because we also have the accuracy metric that's coming out as a result. So can anybody think of how could we make this a little bit more efficient? What can we do in order to cut down on the total amount of time that we take uh, and not have to train every single model and still come up with a pretty good model? What's like the easiest way to do this where I don't want to train every model, but I still want to explore part of the space? You cut down your points and only pick the top five points out of two. Out of each one. Right? Or yeah, I, no, I mean, that's a, that's a really good way to do it. Um, that's definitely one option. The issue with that is you still, so like in this case, that would be training 10 models, right? Not, not unreasonable, pretty, pretty reasonable thing to do. But as soon as you start getting more hyperparameters in order to optimize, you're gonna to need to start doing, well, five and then 10 and then 15 and then, like you end up still having to train a bunch of models by doing that. And because the interactions between these variables can get so complex, there's not really even a soft guarantee from that, that this will end up being a good model versus there's a really simple statistical method which will give us a strong guarantee about uh, which uh, quadrant or how basically uh, which quantile or about how well this model will perform. And it's, it's honestly, you guys are gonna hit yourselves in the forehead because it's so trivial. It's randomly selecting points on the grid instead of traversing the entirety of the grid. Yeah, so the, th this is really referred to as random search, right? Because instead of traversing the entirety of the grid, we're just selecting random points for it. And you might think, well, Danny, that was like such a simple solution. Like, what's the point of that? Like, why, why is that any good? Well, as it turns out, applying random search can actually be more efficient at finding solutions. It's definitely a lot faster at getting you within some top bound. And because it allows you to explore more of the hyperparameter space while trading the same number of models, you can actually get better results if you allow it to explore uh, more in depth of the space, which is you know, a visualization that Bergster and Bengio uh, came out with when, when they were first starting to discuss random search as a real alternative to grid search. Yeah. With the random search, how many points comparatively are you cutting that down to? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a great question. Um, the, and there is a really, really good answer to it. Um, and it is a static number. And in order to get to this number, we can actually do a really, really simple mathematical calculation. The hardest part about this is that we're gonna have to do a logarithm 
which I don't know if you guys remember logarithms from college, but I definitely haven't done one in a while. Um, but there's a really simple formula that's going to tell us if we want to be in the top 5% of all performing models, how, and we want a 95% guarantee of certainty that, it, that our model will be in that top 5%, how many models do we need to train? So uh, this is the formula for it. Let me break down the formula. Um, Q is the acceptable quantile. So in this situation, it's going to be 0.05, because I'm going to say we want to be in the top 5% of models. And P is the required probability of success, right? What is, I want a 95% guarantee. I want to be really, really sure that this is going to be in the top 5% of models. How do the different parameters fit into that formula? Because the number of models I may need to train to check 10 hyperparameters is much different if I'm only checking, let's say, the top three. So I don't see how that fits into this. Yeah, so that's the crazy thing about this formula is that it gives you a static number that I'm going to cheat and tell you guys the number, it's 60. If you train 60 models, as long as you have more than 60 hyperparameter combinations, you have at least a 95% certainty that your model will be in the top 5%. So I know that this is really unintuitive. And the reason that it's unintuitive is because you're usually thinking about things in terms of static, right? So you're thinking like, I want to have the top five models. In this situation, we're saying the top 5% of models, meaning that as your search space expands, as you get more possible hyperparameter combinations and more models that you need to train, the number of acceptable models increases linearly as well, right? Uh, like 5% of 100 is 5, 5% 5 of 500,000 is 5,000, right? So the number of acceptable models increases as the number of uh, total models needing to be trained increases. Does that make sense? I still wonder about things like deep learning where you have to look at different system architectures, like different numbers of layers or activation functions and yeah i mean 60 just seems like very little with the possibilities you have in that space sure so um one thing that's kind of unique about neural networks is that your the definition of a hyperparameter kind of needs to be um enforced for them right so theoretically this is getting pretty deep into neural networks but like theoretically there's no bound to the to the number the number of permutations that a neural network can have right you can have any number of layers, each one of them can have any number of neurons, they can have any number of connections between them, any number of activation functions. So within the context of hyperparameter optimization, and specifically the like grid search approach to hyperparameter optimization, we create a bounded search space, right? We create like a limited number of possible combinations that we're going to be exploring, rather than exploring the entirety of the network architecture that could possibly come up. Um, so I understand what you're saying about like, there's a mind bogglingly huge number of neural networks that we can come up with. But if we want a statistical guarantee within the search space that we're looking for, which means creating a bounded search space, then, uh, then this will give us that guarantee. Um, as I'm going to talk about later, there is a really, really cool set of algorithms based on, uh, really based on evolution, like the biological nature of evolution, which can be used to train neural networks in a way that allows them to be flexible in their system architecture and will actually intelligently design a neural network based off of evolution. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So right now we're gonna be focusing on like the more trivial case of we have a bounded set of hyperparameters and we're only gonna be looking within these hyperparameters, which honestly satisfies the majority of machine learning, right? Like deep learning and neural networks, although people love talking about them, hell, I love talking about them. Realistically, that's not the majority of what a data scientist is gonna be doing versus this type of uh, graph based or like this type of grid search based mm -hmm. uh, optimization will apply for random forest, for gradient boosted trees, even for like your simple linear regression. Make sense? Cool. So uh, we've broken down the different variables in this formula, right? And now let me explain how we got to this formula because it has a lot of one minuses and doesn't look super intuitive, right? So if we think about uh, the process of hyperparameter optimization, as taking random draws from a bag, we can say that each random draw has a Q percent chance of landing in the required range, right? Where Q represents the quantile that we're in. So if we have 100 and we're looking to be in the top 5%, we have a random 5% chance of ending up in the, in the, top, uh, the top percent. Level. So that means that the probability that all of the random draws miss the probability that you know, if we're doing an n number of random draws and they all miss is going to be one minus q, 
right? So that's simply in, inverting the uh, the probability in order to get the, the reverse, and then bringing it to the nth power, right? So if we're doing, um, if we're again looking for the top five percent, and we do three draws, then we have a point. Uh, we have a 0.95. We have a, a 95 percent chance uh, of each one of the draws being wrong, and then for all of the draws being wrong, it's 0.95 to the third. So that means that the probability that at least one of the draws makes it is one minus that, right? Because we're again just inversing the probability. So if we require at least a p percent chance that we get within this last range, uh, we can just solve for n, right? We just need this whole complicated thing, one minus one minus q to the n. We need it to be greater than p in order to get within the required range. Um, if that doesn't make sense, I know that verbal explanations with mathematics aren't necessarily the most intuitive thing. Uh, you can totally check out this paper by Bergstra and Bengio. They pioneered the concept of like, maybe random search isn't a crazy thing to do and actually makes a lot of sense. And the efficiency that it adds from having to select fewer uh, combinations makes sense uh, compared to the, the fact that, you know, you are necessarily going to be getting a worse accuracy score. But generally, top 5% is good enough for most people. So uh, we can make this formula even easier. Um, we're going to, in this situation, as I've been talking about, we're going to set Q and set P, and then we're going to solve for N. So uh, as I've been talking about, we want to be in the top 5%, and we want a 95% guarantee of that. So we just fill in our variables, do some basic algebra, gets us to our logarithm base 95. We plug this into our calculator, into a Wolfram Alpha, or if you're really old, you look back at your, your logarithm graph book that I've never had to use before. Um, and we get that as long as n is greater than 59, so as long as n is 60 or greater, we have a 95% guarantee that your model will be within the top 5%. And even if it's not, so even in that 5% probability that it's not in the top 5%, it's still probably going to be a really, really good model. So um, let's apply the process of random search within our so there we go. So here's our surface area. Uh, we've plotted this again using Plotly. This is our three-dimensional plot where we're comparing two hyperparameters, looking for the interaction between them. Um, if we look at it from this angle, it looks, uh, let's see if I print this one actually. If we look at it from this angle, you might recognize it as looking very, very similar to, uh, to the, the depth of trees visualization, right? And then conversely, if we look at it from this angle, uh, it's a little bit harder to make out, but it still follows somewhat of the same pattern as the number of tree visualization. But as you can see, this is hardly a smooth visualization, right? There is a lot of points of discontinuity or a, a lot of raised edges on this graph. And the reason for that is because there is an interaction between these two variables, right? Which is why we can't just say, take, you know, train it on these 13 options for uh, depth and these 13 options for number, and then pick the best one out of the two. And that's, we now know that that's not going to guarantee us the best overall result, which is why we use something like, uh, like random search to try to optimize this. So um, we're going to be sorting our results by the accuracy. Um, in this situation, we see that it looks like the depth makes a lot more impact than the number of trees. Um, that's something that we can kind of visually make out from this graph, like this, this intuitively looks like there's a much more stable relationship compared to in this graph. So we see that the majority of results have seven as their depth or five, which is really close to seven. And then the number of trees is the thing that varies the most, but that it also tends to stay between eight and nine for the top results. So these are our top results from grid search. This is where we evaluated the entirety of the process. And as you guys saw, it took a while, right? This, uh, this whole thing took 23 minutes to run. So now we're going to be going through the process of, well, how do we optimize this? And random search is the first solution. To that. So we uh, go through our loops again. In this situation, instead of looping through the entirety of the grid, we're only going to be looking at the first 60 results. And then we've scored them. And do I have them sorted somewhere? Yeah, I do. So um, we've again gone, so we've, we've gone through the, the process of training 60 different models. And we can see that the result that we got 
is actually really, really similar to our previous result where, right, where, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is the, sorry. This was the old data, this is the new data. So in this situation, we didn't pick the absolute best performing model, right? The best performing model was uh, depth seven, number of trees 10. The second best performing model though, was depth seven, number of trees nine. And in this situation, that's what we picked, right? We picked the second best performing model while taking it a lot faster to run. Now, yeah, so it took us eight minutes to run and we got almost as good of a result as when it took us more than 20 minutes to run. And this is a pretty small search space that we were doing, right? This is only 169 different combinations. Potentially, you could be looking in the order of thousands, tens of thousands, like the, the list goes on depending on the number of different hyperparameters and the number of different values for those hyperparameters in the store. So random search, way more efficient, but honestly not that fun, right? Because with random search, we're just kind of like randomly picking. So how do we make this more interesting? Well, why are we blindly picking, right? We're training these models sequentially, one after the other. So we're learning something every time. How do we get our system to intelligently learn and to say, what is the next best set of hyperparameters to train? And this is a field of study called Bayesian optimization. So with Bayesian optimization, we have a prior that exists before every model gets trained. And then we update our model, our prior, with the new information that we've gotten from training that model. Um, you can also think of this as trying to apply machine learning to the process of optimizing machine learning. Because really what you're doing is you're trying to predict which model is going to perform the best based on these variables that we're taking in. Um, some people even use random forests to try to predict what the best hyperparameter combination for a random forest model would be. Um, in this situation, I'm going to be talking about a much simpler machine learning process um, really not, not even a machine learning model in order to make this optimization and it's based on Bayesian methods. So with Bayesian optimization, we're going to go through, uh, we're going to go through and train multiple models one after the other. Um, these visualizations come from Axe, which is a platform that was open sourced by Facebook, um, or now a Python package that was open sourced by Facebook. I want to say a month and a half ago which tells you like just how much development is being done in this field right now. Like this is a really hot topic for people all over the industry and in academia as well. Uh, this is a, a really important conversation to be having because it is something that ends up occupying so much of data scientists time, which is why people like Facebook not only develop these tools internally, but even find value in externalizing them. And them. So uh, we've trained our, uh, we've trained our model in the situation five times, right? So on the X axis, we have some uh, we, we have some information about a hyperparameter. In this case, you know, just for this visualization, it's going to be a single hyperparameter. Really, just for the visualization, in the real world, obviously, we'd have more than that. So we're trying to now decide what model should we train next based on these five data points that we have. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to fit a curve, uh, a kernel, which is going to follow these data points pretty closely, and then based off of that we're going to use one of a number of different selection criteria in order to decide which model we should train next. So the simplest training criteria is basically the greedy approach, right? Which is, where do I think the best model is going to be? And try to train the best model next. Um, uh, for those of you who are familiar with greedy algorithms, they often fall into local minima or local maxima, which is really a, a big problem in any kind of sequential optimization algorithm, is that if you are intelligently learning, from prior correct and from prior answers, you have a high probability in finding something that's good, but not the best, right? Um, and that, that's, that's a topic for another time. But uh, when we're going through this process of training, we can select a number of different criteria to use in order to try to minimize the chance of falling into a local minima. We can inject randomness, which is effectively what stochastic gradient descent does when it's training these models. Um, we can look for the best potential improvement. We can look for the most amount of knowledge gained from training this next model. So like in this situation, we see that our five models are all kind of clumped a little bit close together. So maybe we could pick a model further out in the search space in order to increase the amount of information. That we have. And we effectively sequentially train these models in order to come up with what the best possible next model would be. So one really cool thing about Bayesian optimization is that it tends to perform reasonably similarly in terms of accuracy uh, to things like grid search and random search, 
regardless of the number of features that are being fed into the model. But importantly, it tends to hugely outperform them in terms of the total amount of time taken, right? Because instead of searching the entirety of the space, as occurs with grid search, or instead of selecting a number of different points unintelligently on the grid, we're going to be selecting them intelligently. Now, this comes with two big disadvantages, right? The first disadvantage is that we, by not randomly selecting, I'm sorry, three big disadvantages. The first one, as I talked about earlier, is the problem of local minima and local maxima, right? Which we have a, a possibility of falling into. The second major disadvantage is that this is necessarily sequential, right? So whereas with grid search, it would be trivially parallelizable. We could train a whole bunch of different models on a whole bunch of different machines where each model, each machine is training a different model. With, uh, with Bayesian optimization, because it's based on the results of the prior model, we necessarily need to train them sequentially. So that's okay in our situation because we're using Spark, which is a distributed computing engine, which means that we can take advantage of distribution rather than parallelism in order to still reap the benefits of having multiple computers working on a problem at once. But the third disadvantage, and this one is pretty significant, is that we're effectively training a machine learning model every single, we're updating the, the knowledge of a machine learning model every single time we train one of these base machine learning models. Does that make sense, right? Because we're, we're updating this prior information that we had, and this is not a zero compute time problem, right? We need to redraw this line based on the new data that we've had coming in. So depending on the size of the search space, it might actually be more advantageous to do random search than it is to do grid search. Again, this is, uh, in, in any other situation, it's gonna be outperforming grid search, but Bayesian optimization and random search are both really good options, which, um, which one you select really depends on what it is that you're working on. So um, in our context, uh, instead of using the fancy open source Facebook algorithm, I'm using one that came out earlier when I first built this notebook. Um, basically, this package and the majority of Bayesian optimization methods treat the function like a black box, right? So we know that we're passing in a series of parameters and we're getting out a result. The parameters that are being fed in are the hyperparameters for our model, and the result is the accuracy metric. Uh, so we can now train this black box, we can now train this Bayesian optimizer on this black box function that we're defining here, um, it kind of in the same way that we were running our earlier paragraphs, right? Where we need to uh, randomly put in a depth and a number of trees, and then we're going to train our random forest classifier. We're going to fit it to uh, we're going to fit it to the draining data. We're going to transform our validation data, and then get our accuracy score as a result. So, um, as you guys can see, this is still running. Um, it takes a little while to run. In this situation, I'm having it run through 60 points, just like I did with random search. Um, it will probably perform about as well as random search because the search space that we're looking at is pretty small. So the algorithm doesn't have a lot of opportunity to gain a lot of useful information. And because you know, we know that the actual correct result is within a very small space, there's not a whole lot of point of, um, of really training a whole model to determine where the best point is. But just for the sake of this demonstration, we're still running through it. Um, while that's happening, we can go back and start talking about something really cool, which is genetic algorithms. So um, genetic algorithms and evolutionary algorithms, which I kind of use interchangeably, are based on a really fundamental principle in biology, which has been so instrumental in changing the world and making it the way that it is, that it's literally created us and our ability to interpret it, right? Our brains, our bodies, everything about us are as a result of genetic algorithms being implemented in nature. So the key attributes of evolution within biology are inheritance, variation, and competition, right? Where inheritance are that uh, uh, traits are passed along from parents to offspring. Um, as a side note, for those of you who are into mycology or biology, there is uh, recently been a lot of research done into horizontal gene transfer, which is where mushrooms can actually exchange genes with each other rather than passing it along to their children. Um, so that throws a whole bunch of monkey wrenches into our existing con conception of evolution. But in the, in the context of genetic algorithms, we can say that we're going to have parents and offspring. And that sounds a little bit weird in the context of machine learning models, but I promise it'll make sense. Um, and then we also have variation, right? So different organisms have different traits. Some of us have blue eyes, some of us have brown eyes. Maybe these are meaningful, maybe they're not. 
But the important part is that this variation ends up impacting competition, right? So the survival rate of different characteristics is going to be different depending on how well those characteristics can survive in the real world. Except in this case, we're not thinking about the real world, we're thinking about machine learning models. So uh, let's try to try to project this concept of inheritance variation and competition onto machine learning models, right? So the first one is kind of the weirdest one to think about, which is inheritance. So uh, with evolutionary algorithms, we're going to be training first a group of algorithms, a group of machine learning models that are going to have a number of different traits, right? These traits, which are going to be varied, so that's where the variation comes in, uh, are going to be the hyperparameters that we're looking at. And these hyperparameters are going to be passed along between the parent models and the offspring models. So in this situation, maybe we'll have like asexual reproduction, where we'll have random variation occur, like we'll throw in a monkey wrench just like, uh, just like DNA does, where it randomly mutates. Maybe we'll have sexual reproduction where different models mixed together and highly performant models will create uh, combinations of their, uh, their hyperparameters in order to make some more successful offspring. So the inheritance is going to end up resulting in multiple, multiple generations of models that hopefully, with variation and competition, are going to be sequentially improved. Right? Because we're going to end up snipping away as part of competition, we're going to end up getting rid of models that aren't performing that well and not allowing them to reproduce, not allowing them to pass their hyperparameters down into the next generation of models. So taking this in a, a really stepwise and root, uh, root approach, we're first going to be identifying possible attributes. In this case, we're doing hyperparameters and possible values. Right, So we're going to be creating our search space. We're going to create a population of machine learning models with random values for those hyperparameters within you know, whatever hyperparameter space we're looking at. Then we're going to score each model based on the desired metric. So we're going to see how well did this model come out in nature. We're going to select the best performing models and breed them. We might throw in some random variation by having some better models die off and some worse models continue. We might interject like some randomness into the way that they're being bred. But at the end of the day, we want some kind of inheritance to go along so that better hyperparameters um, get passed along so that our models keep continuing to improve. Um, optionally, we can add in random mutation. And the, the purpose for that is to avoid getting stuck in those local minima that I was talking about earlier. And then we're going to rinse and repeat and just keep going through this for however many generations we want. So the end result of all of this is that we're going to have a whole bunch of different models, right? Presumably, this is going to be training probably hundreds if we want this to really be effectual. We're going to be training hundreds of different models. But by the end of it, the goal is that the average accuracy for, um, for the last generation will be higher than the average accuracy for the first generation because we'll have seen sequential improvements. So a uh, really cool thing about evolutionary algorithms, like I talked about earlier, you can treat them in the same way that you treat like grid search or any of these other algorithms. But alternatively, instead of creating our grid, we can also use them to uh, explore a search space kind of randomly, even if that search space isn't defined, which is exactly what Google does these days when it's training new types of network architecture. And Google actually has been releasing a lot of papers on this topic called neuroevolution. It's gotten so prominent that it's actually getting featured in papers in Nature, which is a really prominent uh, science publication. So um, as you can see here, we've got a really simple curve where on the, uh, on the x-axis, we have the wall time, so the total number of hours that this, uh, that this process is running for. And on the y-axis, we have the, the test accuracy. And every point represents a different model. And Google has selected a few different models to show us. So we start off with kind of the like single cell organism equivalent of a model, right? We have uh, a single layered neural network. Over time, our neural networks get more advanced. They get more depth usually. Maybe they'll get more complicated features as a part of them. Um, like this, this algorithm has managed to evolve uh, convolutions and recurrence. That's pretty cool. That's something that took humans a really long time to figure out that this is a useful thing to have within our algorithms. Um, we can see that the majority of improvement, as happens with most, uh, most hyperparameter optimization, the majority of improvement happens all at once in a big elbow, but we can continue to optimize and continue to make our model more complex and also better by continuing to train. And that by the end of this, you know, after running this for 256 hours, Google has effectively created 
uh, a complicated enough neural network that I would say only a human could have ever come up with this because why would a machine make something so convoluted and silly? But at the end, at the end of the day, this model outperformed a lot of the previously trained ones and must have been pretty good for that, right? So that's, you know, that's just talking about how the models are performed against other models. Google also has looked at how does this type of training compare against other types of hypergraphic optimization, specifically against random search and reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning kind of follows a similar vein where you get, um, you, you improve your model based on uh, scores that are coming in. So random search, as we talked about earlier, was already a huge improvement on top of grid search in terms of uh, the ability to explore different types of models. But uh, as Google points out here, this evolutionary, this neuroevolution approach to training machine, to training neural networks actually ends up increasing the test accuracy versus the number of models that are produced. Uh, this is a, a really cool result, and to me points to a lot of possibility in this field, because genetic algorithms are really only something that's been explored within the depth, within the case of machine learning for a few years, but have been under development within the computer science industry since I think like the 70s or the 80s. So genetic algorithms and evolutionary algorithms have been around for a long time. They just haven't crossed paths, haven't cross-pollinated with the machine learning world until now. Um, so I did not implement um, a genetic algorithm for, uh, in, my, in my notebook. We're only exploring 169 different combinations. So you know, we would probably end up training 169 models before we really saw substantial improvement. This really is most useful for like looking at a lot of different types of options and training as Google does neural networks with a lot of different variation and variability. So backtracking to what we started our conversation with, right? Which is uh, the machine learning workflow. If you think about it, everything that I've talked about today has really only been about building and validating models, right? And that's where we've seen the majority of improvement in AutoML. That's where we see the most low hanging fruit in terms of uh, fully automating the machine learning workflow. But that's really only one step, right? The other step that's seen a lot of improvement in the last, I would really say about the last year, has been in the, uh, the data preparation phase, right? And this is really significant because this is the majority of what data scientists spend their time doing. At the start of the talk, I said data scientists aren't monkeys and we should really be paying them to find interesting problems and solve them. But a lot of the time, what data scientists spend, according to HBR, 80% of their time doing is cleaning data. Well, what if instead of having them clean data, we could automate the process of cleaning data, automate the process of extracting interesting features from data, and really let the data scientists identify data and identify problems to solve, which is kind of the dream of automating machine learning. Um, kind of taking a step back, a lot of people see automated machine learning in AutoML, and the first question they ask is like, doesn't that mean that data scientists aren't gonna have jobs anymore? Well, does autocomplete mean that computer programmers are getting paid any less? Like, no, I don't think so, right? Any tool that we can use to improve our efficiency will allow us to focus on the things that are most interesting to us, the things that are really fundamentally human rather than something that we can just outsource to the machines. So in the process of, uh, in the, process of the machine learning workflow, the, uh, the preparation, feature engineering, that ends up taking a lot of time. So a couple of companies and a couple of open source projects have taken it upon themselves to try to automate that process as well. And the most interesting one that I found was uh, a project that has been open sourced in the last few months by Salesforce. So Salesforce had a really interesting problem to solve, right? Um, among one of the billions of things that Salesforce does, they allow customers to put in their sales data and try to make some kind of prediction against some kind of, some kind of characteristic in this data. But Salesforce data can be really complicated, right? It can have timestamps, it can have locations, it can have product information. It can be so complicated that like, there isn't a reasonable way for a, uh, for a human to say that a machine understands it, but there are so many customers that want this kind of thing done for them that Salesforce can't assign a dedicated data scientist to solve every problem for every one of its customers, right? Which is why they had all of this incentive to create, um, to tr create Transmorgrify uh, and to automate this whole pipeline. So the cool thing about this, about Transmorgrify, is instead of just looking at automated model selection, which is all of that we've been talking about today, really hyperparameter optimization as a, as a part of automated model selection, they take the whole thing. So starting with like, let's say we have 
uh, a column that represents uh, the latitude and longitude coordinates of something. Well, what kind of interesting or useful information can we extract out of that? A lot, right? We can find out the zip code, the city, uh, all of this geographic information. We can correlate that with external data sources about the average income in that area. We can talk about, well, maybe it's useful to know how far is this latitude and longitude from the nearest city, the nearest airport, all of these different identifying characteristics which we as humans naturally are good at identifying and which data scientists especially spend you know, their whole lives figuring out how is data interrelated with each other, what kind of data would be useful or interesting for solving this problem. Well, the Salesforce solution is kind of throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, which is really what automated machine learning is about, right? Just like with random search and grid search, we're just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing which model performs the best without any kind of special intelligence. So Salesforce says, well, let's just create or extract all of the possible information from our data set. So like, how far is it from the city? How far is it from the airport? Uh, what's like, what are the incomes in that area? All of that kind of stuff. And then they sequentially train a number of different models. They end up doing feature selection based on which features are performing well. And the whole time they're basically optimizing across an N dimensional space where N is like thousands, where because it's not just the depths and the number of trees as we've been looking at so far, but it's which variables are we keeping, which variables are unimportant, which types of models are we selecting, all of that. Kind of stuff. So um, yeah, there's uh, a whole lot to talk about. And honestly, I think to really do this topic justice, I'd recommend reading the Transmorgrify uh, Medium post where they go really in depth about their methodology, how they selected which features are going to be extracted from data, because uh, they have thought through this problem a hell of a lot more than I have, and they've come up with a really interesting solution for it. So yeah, that's hyperparameter optimization and automated machine learning. Do you guys have any questions about what I've talked about? Don't be shy. I heard that you have a higher chance of getting that JetBrains license if you ask questions. Yeah, but wait a brand new idea. We have time for probably three or four questions, so. Well, I think we've got zero, so. No questions? How big a, you were talking about your computations, how big a Spark stuff are you playing with, like, server-wise? Um, I would love to talk about Spark and Kubel. So, <laughs> so uh, Kubel doesn't like run Spark ourselves, right? We're not, um, we don't provide uh, like a consulting service for somebody and we honestly barely do any data science or analytics in house. Please don't tell my bosses that I said that. Uh, what we do is we provide a platform that allows our customers to use their own Spark clusters. We like pre-install Spark on them. We provide them a pretty interface and a whole lot of support to do that. Um, our customers use the largest Spark clusters on the cloud. So they have uh, Spark, Spark clusters over a thousand nodes. How many nodes were you playing with when you were taking oh, this? I mean, we can, we can take a look. It was, it was small. Like the data set that I was looking at was pretty small. Um, and yeah, so I was only running this with two nodes. So it was barely even running it. Okay. Yeah. So when these guys are playing with big data sets, like what type of time computation do they wade through right now? Yeah, so I mean, it really depends, right? Like it depends, it, even in the case of hyperparameter how, how optimization. How many variables are there? Yeah, exactly. Like for hyperparameter optimization, it's like how many models do I need to train? Also like how complex is each model? A different model will take a different amount of time to train, which is another thing that we didn't really talk about is like a model with 100 trees that are each 100 deep is going to take a lot longer to train than a model that's one tree with one depth. Um, so yeah, so it's super high variability. Um, I've talked to customers who leave these things running for multiple days at a time. Um, I personally don't want to wait for anything to run longer than a few minutes, but that's why I use small. I'm just curious that I'm really new to the space. So. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great question. Just there's no answer. <laughs> So can you, can you analyze more than one model at a time? Like, instead of the random tree, can I use um, other models at the same time while the data is getting analyzed with random tree? Yeah, so it really depends on the architecture that you're using. Um, so when we're comparing different types of models against each other, 
we usually can't find a lot of interesting relationships. Like the number of trees in a random forest isn't, or the best number of random trees in a random forest isn't really going to tell us much about which kernel is going to perform the best in SVM. So we can basically run them totally in parallel. Um, you can run them on the same cluster in Kubel. You can have them separated out to different clusters. You can run them sequentially. You can run them in parallel. Um, yeah, it really just depends on like what type of architecture you want to have set up. I would say in general at this point, you know, I talked about model selection at the beginning of the talk, but the majority of the time, if you're optimizing for accuracy, you're probably going to be selecting one of two model types. Either you're going to be using gradient boosted trees, so commonly referred to as XGBoost because that's the one library that really popularized them. Um, and that's been shown to be incredibly performant in like Kaggle competitions, which are really just tests of how well can you optimize this model, like how well can you perform on accuracy, or neural networks, which tend to perform really well for a very sub, a very few number of cases, like image recognition, text recognition, NLP, you know, all the, all the cool stuff that everybody's excited about. So like model selection doesn't tend to be the most common issue that people run into, because usually coming into it, you kind of know what you want out of your model, right? Like you would pick a linear regression because you want it to be interpretable. You'd pick uh, gradient boosted trees because you want it to be performant. Well, if you guys do have more questions and you're just shy about asking them, I will be hanging out and continuing to eat pizza until we ran out of pizza or pizza. Okay, or, or <laughs> my stomach explodes. Um, feel free to ask questions about data science, Kubel, automated machine learning. Um, I like rock climbing too, if you guys want to talk about that. And, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Thank you.